Hi folks, we're back and I have another incredible guest. I have spoiled you, not one, not two, but three amazing guests, one after the other. You're welcome is all I have to say about that. Um, today, <laughs> do you know what? It's really bad. I've been practicing how I'm going to introduce Lisa and it's fine. It's going to be fine. But um, Lisa is a friend of mine. She's also part of our um our community, my uh, which now I can't remember the name of the waiting room community. Waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> At least you know what's going on, and it's because I'm anxious about saying it. L Lisa has her own podcast, which is in French, and it is Mon Gros Podcast. Yes, which, yes, <laughs> my big podcast. But I was literally rehearsing. I didn't want to butcher the French language publicly, like so it would be on the internet forever. I tried my best. That was it. But yes, she has an amazing podcast, which she's now going to tell us all about. If that's okay with you, please, please, that I'll stop talking. So oh, hello, my podcast is called Mon Gros Podcast, which is exactly what you said. So congrats. And I'm Lisa. Um, I'm 47. Uh, I have this podcast for almost two years now. No, no, a year and a half. And it's uh, it's an incredible experience to me to speak about things that matters a lot to me. And it was, it's really, a, I re I'm receiving a lot of feedback, very amazing feedback, but I am learning so much with that too. It, it really feels like I'm giving stuff to people and I am receiving so much too, only with the fact of people listening to me. And what is the most amazing to me is that I used to be a fat person in a not fat environment, let's say. I didn't have a lot of fat friends or whatever. I never realized that before. And having this podcast allowed me to meet so many people like me. And that was amazing. Having people who really understand, who are never going to challenge like you know, when you say the doctor was mean to me, it was fat phobia. And they're like, are you sure? Maybe he was just having a bad day. And I'm like, no, I am sure. I know what I'm saying. <laughs> and so it's really great to have a community, like you said. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. When you said that, are you sure? I wanted to punch something. Like there was a desire, a sudden need to hit something. Now, for <laughs> those astute people listening in, you may know that Lisa has the most amazing accent and we're all going to fawn over it because we all know it's one of the sexiest accents on the planet and yes yes she's rather she's rather spectacular obviously you are French you live in um, France yeah. um tell us a little bit about your lovely life don't show off or gloat too much just a small <laughs> amount of gloating okay but not too much I'll cut you off if I need to yeah thank you very much <laughs> uh, so yeah I'm living in the center of France uh in around Lyon if you know it uh, so just in the middle of uh, having the Alps on one side and the sea next to me, it's, uh, I was raised, born here, always worked here. Um, I did a lot of stuff in my life, but I'm working for 20 years as, um, um how do you say that? Um, I'm, I'm managing projects in different environments and my main way of working is uh, process improvement so I'm always looking at stuff like what can we do now <laughs> and I'm doing that also in my life which is a little bit annoying of always trying to improve stuff <laughs> when sometimes it's just good to have it as it is um, I was a fat person for a long time in the shaming side of it uh, let's say I was not born um, fat I was uh, I started to get fat I would say for real around my 20 after my first Weight Watcher but before <laughs> that I was a very um, I was doing a lot of sports so I was chubby let's say and people start to call me fat but honestly when I'm seeing the picture today I'm like are you serious <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was really not <laughs> yeah. and so that was a, a very weird ways of meeting my body because I'm I'm also I'm having a PCOS which means that I'm starting to have a lot of women stuff coming out around my 10 11 years old mm. so it was really weird to me because I became you know my body was really changing a lot and the way people were looking and talking to me also but me I never identified as fat before yeah I was 18 and I started the first diet with my mother worst idea ever 
<laughs> going to Weight Watcher with your mom, hmm, not a good idea. And then, uh, yeah, the weight cycling stuff, uh, having more weight, losing weight, more, etc. And then around my 40s, just before that, on my 39 years, I was diagnosed with so many stuff, like diabetes, uh, Shimoto, PCOS, like I said, and everything changed. And I started first by having my biggest diet ever, which, again, did not work as any of the other one. And even because I was having all this sickness, it was even worse than any other diet before. And I met my nutritionist, and it was the, the beginning of, uh, yeah, discovering fat phobia, internalized fat phobia. Um, things could be different, having another. And all of this happened through Instagram, through people like you, actually, uh, of hearing another voice, another way of seeing things. And it really, really changed my world. And it was like, yeah, seven years ago. And uh, now I'm such a different person. I'm more in the acceptance world, trying to say this is the way it is. How can I work with this? Instead of I need to change, I need to be different, I need to eat less, this type of thing. But it was, it was an incredible journey, really. And I'm very frustrated that it happened to me so late in my life. You know, I'm, I'm discussing uh, through the podcast with people who are like in their 20s or 30s, and I'm so happy to see how they are going fast into, uh, you know, fighting all this. And next time I'm like, I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy you don't have to wait so long to just be at peace with that because we deserve peace and we deserve it before we are sick and this type of stuff. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's, that's what I can say. <laughs> Why? It was Why? a long sentence. <laughs> you were doing so well and then you apologized for no reason. It was just really, really good. We were all like, yeah. And then you were like, I'm sorry. I'm like, wait, what? No. Uh, I, 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 I hear your story and I'm like, oh, I've heard that story before. And that's because I have over and over again. It is such, it's like a pipeline, right? Especially with people with PCOS. So what happens? It all changes. Oftentimes it's early onset. Um, you grow a chest, two big round boobs start forming. <laughs> and here. Yeah. You grow <laughs> hips and thighs and it's quick and there are stretch marks and you know some people are fat a lot of times actually like you say chubby or like you know and 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 this idea of being chubby has a lot to do it's not chubby it's just that you went through puberty early and so you developed no but I I use I use chubby also because I was really doing a lot of sports so I was athletic let's say you know it was yeah yeah I wasn't just only having these I was also strong and oh. everything was mixed up and I'm like I don't like the way you describe my body guys <laughs> no quite and then and then there is that idea that maybe I'm fat uh and then the first weight watchers I mean you wait you're you you waited until 18 or you and your mum went I, I've heard stories of like being 10 so I think it, it could have started earlier but 18 is um. young and then decades of weight cycling because that's exactly what you're being told to do this is the solution this is the cure you have pcos you must lose weight and then oh guess what happens hashimoto's diabetes i mean i could have predicted that i could have bet money on it really early on and then i would be rich by now so <laughs> i feel like the story whilst is it's so important and is of course very unique is also it's important that people who are listening and following along and like nodding and going oh that happened to me yet yeah, this is not a surprise it happens to a lot of people and it's just because of a medical system that is really designed to harm fat people okay. and 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 this weight cycling and then autoimmune condition that is you know messing around with your thyroid hormone is classic part of weight cycling yeah and just to clarify i was diagnosed with PC- pcos on my 39 yeah. so the 20 the 30 years from my 10th mm. to my 40th where i was having all this stuff weird that everybody was putting on my weight. And actually, it was PCOS that was making stuff weird and that I was gaining weight and not being able to regulate. But yeah. I find out this after yeah. that. I all, all the things about my periods, I, I struggled with that for 30 years yeah. before I finally heard that it was a condition, that it wasn't me, that it wasn't my weight. 
And it's it's also because I never really tried to have kids. And PCOS is very often diagnosed when we try. Yeah. And if you don't, then they try to see that. But if you are only fat and having periods that are messing with you, well, it's just because of you manage yeah. with your own mental health, whatever. Yeah. Be stronger with or something. Yeah. Yeah, will it away, use your brain, either like, you know, use your willpower and all your weight daily yeah. together at the same time. And that way yeah. it will all get better. Yeah, such a, I mean, it's when you think about it, when you say it out loud, it just, you realise just how incompetent the medical profession is. And this is misogyny. This is weight stigma. This is, you know, if this is about phobia, weight stigma, whatever you want to call it. This is, this is really capitalism also. It's just this, there's this, this focus on, the needs of a few and it disregards the needs of so many so you know mm. it, it, it doesn't surprise me but equally enrages me and you <laughs> of course I I wanted to talk about this because I think you were you'd be the perfect person to discuss it with I the last time I was in Lyon was about I think it was now three years ago I'm trying to think it was after Covid that I, I yeah I traveled there after the pandemic so it couldn't have been that long ago. And um, one of the things I know about Lyon is it's often described as, you know, one of the, the gastronomic capitals of the world. Like, you know, and I ate well, very well while I was there. But there is this idea that French people, especially, you and, uh, you know, have this really healthy diet. And like, you know, we're always talking about, oh, but look at the French. The French are somehow... Really? superior <laughs> yeah do you not know that like this is what we're told just look at the French if only we could be more like the French but I'd love to know for me this feels very classist and I once read an article by a you know a French person who was saying you know sure maybe if you live in you know some arond uh, oh no I'm going to try and say arrondissement is that yeah. right yeah. in Paris and you can shop in the local stores and you know but but the reality is most people are shopping in a supermarket and they don't live mm. in a beautiful part of town they live yeah. in the suburbs and living normal life so what mm. is you know can you maybe dispel some of the myths about this amazing <laughs> French lifestyle that you will have? I think it's true that we can definitely say there is a culture around food and cooking and stuff like that. That's for sure. And in Lyon, it's true because uh, it's uh, Paul Bocuse uh, who is a very uh, master of food and everything. And he has several restaurants. He's dead now, but he's a very historical yeah. cook in the world, whatever. Um, so yeah, there is a tradition and there is a cultural stuff around food and we have the, you know, the forever meals on Sundays and all this stuff. We do have that going to restaurant and, and yes, cooking is very, very important, but I, I think this is what we can put in the carte postale. Okay. That's how French mm -hmm. are. The truth is. My grandmother was really uh, cooking a lot. She was another generation, etc. But she mm -hmm. never ever taught me anything. She never mm -hmm. ever welcomed me in the kitchen to talk me about what she was doing. My mother, she was a working mom. Uh, she did not really appreciate cooking or whatever. So it was going fast. It was, it's not, I, I don't think uh, we had anything about eating or having access to food that is not accessible anywhere else. And I think it's true that, um, as in any other country, we have uh, poverty and people are not accessing super amazing food. It's true that, I mean, if you want to find them and if you have the money for, you can. It's true. And maybe in some other countries, it's less possible. But it's still very expensive. It's still very, uh, yeah, it's a classist way of seeing stuff to think everybody in France can have access to everything. And, it, and it's even sometimes going um, on the wrong way because people feel guilty, like uh, uh, we should be really good with food. Uh, uh, how can you be fat and living in France? Because, whoa, you you are learning so many things. You should know so much about food. And you, oh, and there is the other way around. Like, yeah, yeah, it's a food country. So no matter, no, it's normal and people get fat because they are cooking everything with butter and oil and stuff like that, because this is this is how cooking is supposed to be. Right. So there is there so many things, and there is so much with alcohol, which is really difficult to me because I don't drink. And I think even more than food, it's food and wine. I mean, it's impossible to not have this conversation in France. 
and and it should not because I know a lot of people who really don't care about that even if they are really good French people <laughs> <laughs> yes and it's it's such a stereotype but I remember I know. always hearing so and and in fact I talk about this with Italians as well you know we have yeah. the Mediterranean diet my I mean, grandmother was Italian yeah. oh really oh yeah. well, and then this idea that like you know oh it's all low carb and lots of vegetables lots of you know and no fats and stuff and the irony is it's always been France or Italy that's all we're ever taught here in the UK it's France or Italy these are the diets to emulate and yet Italians think it's hilarious because they're like we live on carbs are you crazy like <laughs> pasta pasta rice pizza all we invented all of these things and French people will often be like you know we cook with a lot of butter right like we have a <laughs> cream yeah, and yeah. butter <laughs> that's such a great right? which is and 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 cheese like for the French yeah people. oh yeah sorry I forgot no but cheese is not even you have <laughs> cheese and that's it it's not even an ingredient it has to be there <laughs> It has to be that, yeah. Like, let's agree. I mean, let's agree that that we that that is sacred. So, yeah, you're right. I didn't mention religion. Cheese, you're right. Yeah, cheese is really it's really a big deal. It is a big deal. But yeah, I, I have to say one thing I will say about France is that, that every time I'm there, I notice that even the products you buy from the supermarket, like they taste better. I feel like the really farming okay. standards. Yeah, you pick up a, t a tomato or a cucumber in France, it will taste better. Like that, I guarantee you. Even in the cheapest supermarket, it still tastes better. <laughs> okay. But I, I do wish we would stop romanticizing certain cultures because, like you say. It's not fair either way. It's not fair to compare ourselves. And it's also not fair to French people who are basically being told, like, you're the expert, so you should know better. Because why? Like you said, your mum was oh, working yeah. and she had to make quick food. And exactly. you know, no one taught you. And so thank you for sharing that. And to those who pay, are paying attention to a lot of the work that is going on around um, decolonizing your plate you know this idea that there is a correct way to eat there isn't the correct way to eat is the, the is the way that makes you happy it's my is my belief hey. the way that makes you happy whatever makes you happy you do that um so you and I have it's, a lot in common it's true that I'm sorry I'm just thinking it's a yeah. really good point that you know if you are meeting people talking about diet in France the first thing that everybody's telling you is that you should cut cheese you know and I think it's not something that you may say in another country but I know in France whatever doctor you go to see whatever age you are the first thing they say is like you should cut burgers and cheese oh, so, and I'm like no. <laughs> no also see the thing is it's difficult to get good quality cheese we do have cheese we have French cheeses that are imported to the UK but it's difficult to get so whenever I'm in France my f literally my first stop is to buy a, a lot of cheeses some nice bread and i'm sorry i will go for the wine bread oh you're yeah. right bread oh bread the yeah, bread yeah. bread cheese and wine yeah, you see you talk about french diet but we are eating <laughs> bread yep. with cheese at almost every meal with wine <laughs> yes. and and i and if someone told me to give up English cheese, because there, well, there are some nice cheeses. I'm like, there. okay, I can give up I on this. Cope. <laughs> I could cope, but if you surrounded me, my yeah, it's true. When they are saying you can cut the cheese, they are not talking about the cheddar on the burger. They are talking yeah. about the, the only one. Oh, I'm okay. like, <laughs> no, that's not for me. I'd, thank you. I'd rather I'd take my chances. Whatever you're I agree. I agree. <laughs> cheese is worth it. It's my real belief is that i will do anything for cheese i need a t-shirt that says i will do anything for cheese on really my... yeah i think that's that's a merch idea. i mean i have a condition because i found out kind of recently that it's not an allergic but it's i'm sharing this with the world because it's um oh my god how i'm going to say that are you gonna say lactose intolerance because i feel no, not exactly like that it's it's small like this it's the put the uh, cow protein yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can so eat. Like... No, because it's not exactly the same. Because, for example, you can find some milk without lactose, uh -huh. and it's not going to work for me either. Oh, so I cannot eat. Ev so, when I'm, we are talking about cheese, it's been two or three years that I'm focusing on, you know, goat cheese, which is good. It's my favorite. Yeah. I'm happy with it. But do you know raclette? Oh, <gasps> that's that's the most amazing cheese ever, and. <gasps> I have a deal with my nutritionist, which is I will never, ever, ever not do raclette. 
Okay. I pre- and I have this this allergy is coming with a um, eye infection or otitis, and I'm starting to lose my voice. And so every time I'm doing a raclette, I know that during three days I don't have <laughs> miss it. Oh, but I'm like I don't care for this cheese. I'm taking everything. I cannot have a winter without this. Right. It doesn't exist. <laughs> we we're all in agreement with you. It's funny, you know. Nutritionists always say like, you can eat whatever you want unless you're allergic to it. And we're like, uh-uh. I see you, but I disagree. <laughs> unless it's anaphylactic. There is allergic and allergic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if I'm gonna die or I'm fine. <laughs> if I'm like literally need an epipen, I won't do it. But other than that, like I if I'm just going to have a sinusite for a few days, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's that folks is how much we care about cheese some of you are a bit like "Eh, i could take it or leave it that's fine you carry on but some of us adore cheese with a passion and for me if you're saying it it's because you didn't taste it yeah probably you didn't taste you haven't had proper french cheese from france that's that's where it's at Uh, (laughs) let me tell you right now when you get brie in the supermarket here because brie is probably the most common it's not real brie it's like i don't know what it is but i'm always like this is not this is not what I, this is not what I, this is not what I know like that. <laughs> this is not, I have to go and get the specialized, you know, I have to go and get like, I'm not, not any of it. It means if you want cheese from France, you have to go in specific stores and specific uh, area to have this type of no. food. No, you can get it from any, but it's probably slightly more expensive because it will ah. be like a brand that you have in front, as opposed to like, you know, every supermarket here will make its own brie or own camembert. And even some of the, you know less well-known cheeses will make their own but if you want like a you know proper sort of ripe brie mm. then you have to go and buy the the expensive you have to go for the good quality expensive stuff i don't have yeah. problems money on cheese people okay. i will i will sacrifice a lot but anyway i think we spent enough time talking about cheese so that's now now i mean i'm you know i don't edit it so there's going to be an entire 10 minutes devoted to cheese on the podcast Some which is like, okay i mean we should be able to talk about cheese and food on the fat podcast talking about fat people <laughs> that is so true that's so true and now i've lost my train of thought no i remember now i was going to say apart from our love of cheese and and our belief system our religion of cheese we also have a lot of things in common and that is that you know both had a diabetes diagnosis both dealing with the same bullshit uh i would love to hear uh well so I said what I was going to talk to you about was that you and I both have come to a place of fat acceptance it wasn't always there we've been on a journey we're at we're on that journey life is good we have a podcast we're telling other people you know we're feeling good and then we have an appointment with a diabetes (laughs) doctor or nurse and everything goes to shit now tell me what how do you feel and uh, we can talk about this together how do you feel about the fact that on the one hand you know stuff like weight loss is not the solution but on the other hand you still have to face that doctor look them in the eye and deal with the lecture like how does that how does that i know i think it it, sometimes it feels i'm i'm two person in one (laughs) i'm like who are you i remember the first time i met the the first time I met the last endocrinologist that I will never meet again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was a year ago. And she was talking so strong. And I was sitting in front of her of her. And in my head, I was like, okay, come on, maybe I can give a try. Maybe I can do another diet to try. And then there was another voice saying, Are you serious? Mm-hmm. What are you talking about? You know it doesn't work. You know it's not possible. But she was, I don't know, I don't know, maybe she was better than better in the bad way of the other doctor I met, but she was so strong. I mean, this, she told me something, trigger warning. I don't know, I'm going to say that she said something to me like, you know, you have to cut on sugar. Uh, you know, if you eat one fruit in the week, it's good. And I was like, one fruit in the entire week? You think that's my level of sugar? (laughs) Let me not tell you what I eat this morning. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I am eating fruit several times a day. (laughs) (laughs) And in the meantime, so she was saying crazy stuff. And a part of me was like, you know, it's not true. But in the meantime, I was like, okay, it seems I'm in so much trouble. 
maybe I should try one last time. And I had to remember myself that um, I actually consulted a surgeon for bariatric surgery mm -hmm. like five years ago. And he told me no. <laughs> and he said, no, you don't need this. I'm not going to do that on you. You you should just continue. I was starting to uh, to work on this and to cut off all my belief with food, cutting diet. And he was really like, no, no, continue this. You're young. Go for that. Give it a try. And so when she was talking to me, I'm like, Lisa, you actually consulted someone expert with this. She's not. She's a diabetes expert. She's not the one who is going to do surgery or whatever. And I told her that. And I'm like, no, but I really tried. You know, I, I even... But they said no. And she's like, no, but maybe, what can I tell you, lady? I'm yeah. telling you, I met the expert of this, and he said, no. I'm telling you that I'm doing my best and working with the nutritionist, but it's still not enough. And it was really, really weird. I think it was the first time in several years that I heard myself saying, maybe I can try another diet. And I'm like, what? Who are you? Who, who the hell are you? You know it's not true. You know it's not working. And then I, when I went away in my car, I was like, you know, I was, um, I don't know. I felt I was under a spell or something. Mm -hmm. Even consider that with everything that I know. But to be honest, even with a podcast, even with knowing all of this, it's, it's like 40 years of hearing something yeah. and five years of working on it. So I'm not saying I will need 40 years of fighting fat phobia to erase the previous belief, but still it's not enough in proportion. And what is important, I, I'm always trying to do the, the comparison because I quit smoking. I smoked for 20 years and I was able to quit smoking in without any method or whatever. So you cannot come to me about my willpower or whatever. I have what I have. If I have to cut on something, I was able to do it. Because I knew why, why I was doing it. So, But the thing is, you don't need cigarettes. You don't need it to live. You don't need it in your life. So if you want to cut it, you can just cut it. Food, whatever happens, you need to eat every day. You need to confront yourself with food every day. So you cannot just say, I'm going to fix it. Because it's everywhere. And it's everywhere in a fat phobic world. So 40 years of hearing uh, you should not be fat, all the diet culture bullshit, all this money-making stuff. And five years, even if I'm really doing very hard and, and reading many stuff and many books and many podcasts, it, for the moment, it doesn't count enough. And another way of looking at that would be to say yes, but you, when the voice popped out and said maybe you should yeah. do another diet, another voice came along and went, uh, no, no, you're right. But it yeah. means that's why the the voice of maybe you should try is coming. Yeah, that's why it's coming. It's because there is 40 years yeah. living as a fat person in a fat phobic world. But yeah. those five years, like you said, it's the little voice saying, "Come on, you know yeah. you're not going to do that." Yeah. So it's good, but you still need to to build further uh, to really be able to say no, even even before listening entirely I, I the only thing i was very proud of myself it's when she talked about uh biotech surgery and i said yeah i met a doctor about it but he said no and she's like yeah but maybe you can consider maybe you can see someone else because if it was five years ago things changed for you and i'm like you know it's a surgery with something like 60 percent fading numbers <laughs> and she was typing on her computer and she looked at me like I'm like, yeah, you know that most people, they gain weight again. Uh, there is a lot of trouble with mental health and everything. And she was like, yeah. And after this moment, she looked at me like I was an enemy. To <laughs> mm -hmm. She realized that I, I, I would have stuff to say back to her. And she really didn't like it. She's and you know how it ended. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not a fan of this particular endocrinologist. No, let it be uh, I'm not a fan of this doctor. <laughs> and let's say there's it's an ex-endocrinologist for a reason. But I think there was also something about the kind of delay in processing. You know, like, I think that when we go and sit in front of a doctor, our brains switch off. The, yeah. the, the rational, kind of, like, intelligent, assertive part of our brain that, you know, 
put us in a in a work call or meeting or even like public speaking or whatever and it's fine yeah. it's functioning normally you put us in front of a doctor and it's like it takes us until we've left the office are sitting in our car and suddenly we're like wait did did they say that or even did I say that like you know I did I like go along with that no. because you don't you can't even process what's happening in the moment and there are studies that show that we only retain something like 10 to 20 percent of what was said in a doctor's consultation uh, we actually don't remember even 10 minutes later we've forgotten most of it so yes and you you say to me and you've said this to me quite a few times I feel like a little girl when I'm in front of my doctor yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean and that's the same it's like that's why I'm still thinking about these 40 years. These 40 years where you are told that doctors, they are the one who knows everything. You need to do what they say. You need to follow what they say. And honestly, it, before I, I realized what, what, what fat phobia was and everything, I think I, I have never ever challenged or even just, when I'm saying challenge, it's too, it's too big word, but even just reconsider what a doctor could have told me. It never mm. happened to me. And since I started to work in fat phobia, it seems it's become my daily stuff without being, I don't want to be a completist saying all doctors are horrible people, don't trust them. That's not what I mean. But it's just coming back to the idea that, okay, the doctor comes with their medical experience, their studies, their education, whatever. But I come with the expertise of my body. And the fact that you just sit there and you, it's like in school, doctors, teachers, you are not supposed to answer. You are not supposed to feedback. You are not supposed to say, I'm sorry, you are prescribing this, but I'm not so sure. I remember when they started with Ozonpeak and I was like, mm, I'm so scared of injection. And he, she was like, it's a super fancy new drug. It's a revolutionary drug. And I was like, Mm, even that is not convincing me and I wasn't even able to ask for a three months delay not just saying okay maybe I will try but give me a moment mm -hmm. <laughs> because it really feels like yeah you're talking to the to the teacher you are you are a rebel you know you are very revolutionary you don't want to trust doctors I know what I'm prescribing to you you know it's I hate that's why I feel like a little girl I feel like yeah, someone is giving me a lesson or a lecture and I'm just supposed to take it. And it's very unpolite to be like, uh, okay, I hear you, but you know, I know how I'm living my life and I think something that I have to take five times a day will make my life very difficult at work, for example. I honestly had to change my work. I, I became a working from home only to manage the, the men because some of them were impossible to deal with during the day because they are impacting me too much. And I, I had a, a very bad experience with metformin and I had to go through for three years. And even today, my, I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't a podcaster at the time, so it's okay. <laughs> but I mean, how come I agree for three years of being sick as hell yeah. with a drug that was yellow, a powder that I have to put in my meals three times a day. And it took me three years to tell doctor, I cannot anymore. I cannot live like this. My life is becoming impossible. I had to work from home. I had to change, you know, three years only because they are doctors. And you're like, I, I need to be a good girl who is going to be diagnosed and cured by these doctors and just don't say anything yeah it's unbelievable because i am not i'm not a follower i'm not someone yeah. like that but when it's about health which by the way it's about death basically that's what we think behind right and it's about doctors yes i'm becoming a little girl <laughs> yeah hard. and you know i wonder like you know uh you know when we say little girl I mean I when you say little girl I also identify with little girl you know yeah I'm sorry yeah, yeah. No, no, no 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 actually because I was thinking of myself as that little girl as well but you know however you identify but I I wonder if you're a little boy I wonder and I, I, and I, and I don't know I, I would know. love to hear from men I think that uh so I, I'm married to a dude with diabetes so to be fair uh -huh. I know he gets treated differently to begin with really? much, 
be believed. Yeah, and he's not very fat. So hmm. he is a little bit fat. He has just entered into the, the world of fatness and he dips in and out depending on what medication he's on. So he's like borderline. I would call him mid-size. I don't even think he's fat. Uh, and he so he he has a different experience. Now, to be fair, he's black, so he gets a lot of crap anyway. But we talk about like, you know, he he says, like, I don't feel almost the paralysis of being a little child and there's this big scary doctor and like I'm just trying to be good and because that is when you're conditioned as a woman that is what you're taught from a very young age be good don't talk back make yourself small be kind at all costs you know d don't don't take up space yeah and you're physically taking up space you need to make yourself even smaller because shame on you for taking up space in the first place and so we we do this like shrinking and I am not you and I are not wallflowers we do not shrink into the background we have a voice we're not afraid to use it but stick me in front of a doctor that's a totally different situation mm -hmm. and my most and I I, I want to hear about your most recent sort of diabetes experiences but my most recent one I uh so my A1C has been high. I had to start a third medication and I have had a back and forth with this nurse. I don't get to see a doctor. I have a nurse and she's great, but she, she and I just have to agree to disagree about weight and diet. But uh, she wanted to start me on uh, some aglutides. We can't get Ozempic, the injection here in the UK. There's still stock issues. So she wanted to start me on the medication, the oral tablet form, which is Ribulsis. Okay. It's the same drug, but it's the tablet form. And I knew she was going to say it and I was, I was ready. And I said, actually, I don't want to take that. I want to take this instead. And I told her the drug I wanted to take instead. And she said, okay. And I said, look, I know what the side effects are and I can't do it. I just can't do it. Please, please don't make me. And I, and even though I had planned in my mind exactly what I was going to say, it still felt a little bit like a little child going, please don't do it, please. And I had to ask her permission, even though she had no right to tell me what to do. And she was actually, she actually sided with me. And she said, you know what, that's really reasonable. I hear you. I'm not sure your plan's going to work, but we can totally try it. Uh, and I just said, look, if I absolutely have to take some maglutide and it is my only choice, I will consider it. But I'm not doing it if there are other options because I cannot tolerate the side effects. One of the worst things about this drug is you have to take it half an hour before you put anything else inside your mouth. And so what a ch I mean, like, <laughs> like my husband will wake up, he's hungry and he cannot eat for half an hour because he has to take the stupid medication. And that in of itself is a problem. Why it's, you know, how can doctors and nurses think it's okay to ask somebody to do that? Are oh, you hungry? Tough. Just wait. You know? <laughs> and like you said, with the metformin, I mean, we all know what the side effects of metformin is. If you don't know, look it up. It's not pleasant. There's a reason yeah. why you can't leave the house. Because yeah. you can end up in trouble. And that's horrendous. But like you said, three years you tolerated it until you finally just said, I simply can't take it anymore. At no point in time prior to that did you think, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore, you know, which is just. I never felt that I would have the right to say it's too much for me, guys. It's really too much for me. I know it's the drugs for diabetic people, but I'm sorry, I'm, it's not working for me. And and same for Ozonpic. I took Ozonpic for two years. I had all the um, nausea stuff, mm -hmm. but it never worked on my diabetes. I'm not even talking about losing weight. I did not lose anything. Yeah. <laughs> but even on the, 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 the amazing work it was supposed to do on my diabetes, it never worked for me. But I still waited two years. And they waited with me because my numbers were, were still not okay. And we were still continue trying. But to come back to your last experience, I think that's what I gained most of discussing with you and working on this. It's last time I came with a plan. So it's not to my endocrinologic. The, on the, ah, I'm done that with it. Yeah, that one lady. But I I came to my GP with a plan to say, okay, don't send me to any more endocrinologist ever again. <laughs> you and I, we are going to work on this together because in UK they do that with nurses. So don't tell me you cannot deal with me. <laughs> I was so ready to say you uh, you and me, we are going to partner on that. And I was like you, I was like, please, please, please. That's my only option. And she actually came with it. She was like, yeah, it's very reasonable. She said the same. She said, we don't know if it's going to work, but I'm okay to try it for six months with you. We are going to follow up on this. It's okay. And 
I think something switched in a year, I would say, because, yeah, I feel like a little girl, etc. But step by step, now that I have identified that, now that I've had understood how it was to be sitting there and, and having no words to come out, having my brain being frozen, now that I know that, I can prepare a little more and I have a way to speak. I'm trying to always be on, let's be partners. It's my life. I am the one taking the drugs. I am putting them in my body. I am the one working with all of this. I am the one with the fatigue, with the pain, with all of this. And you are the one with the knowledge. Okay, but let's mix it and find a way together. And I think last time it worked, you know, but I tried for a year and for a year it wasn't working. But with that one doctor, I don't know, it worked. And I'm so happy and I'm so relieved of it. And I think it's... Uh, it's super powerful. It's really a matter of empowering ourselves that, yes, doctors are amazing people. They have great knowledge and education. And <laughs> Yes, they are. Maybe you're watching some on YouTube. Them. Some, some of them. Some of them. Whatever. Okay. Them. <laughs> but they are even better when we can be patient with a voice and voicing for ourselves. And, you know, because sometimes... To be fair, some patients are also coming, waiting for, you know, enlighten me with your knowledge. And they, the doctors don't even have the information they need because the patient is just like, give me what you have to give me, which is not okay on patient side too. Both people need to become, we are human. I know my body, my life, you know, medical stuff. Let's work together, you know. I just want you to know, Let's Be Partners is going to be the name of this podcast episode. When you said it, I was like, there's the title. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, that I'm going to quote you. In fact, in years to come, I will quote you for saying that. You're, that is so spot on. It should be a partnership. And in medicine, we're told that it is a partnership. But I think wow. actually that's a, that's a really good way of looking at it. Like, let's just come as two equals, two equal partners to the table. You bring your stuff, which is the, you know, the degree and the science and the knowledge and the, and also the power to write the prescription, which is very important because otherwise I'd write my own. And then I'll bring all the other stuff, the lived experience, and also the stuff that makes me unique because no two bodies are the same. I will bring the information. I will, I will give you the information, which sometimes people don't feel like they can because you know they, they're afraid of what's going to happen so they they don't share but if we can come like equal partners and it requires us both to step up to the plate but if we can do that actually it becomes a much I agree. well I mean we're still stuck in a system and that's the thing I like, agree. doctors are not all bad I make a face because it's not the doctors it's the <laughs> system that we work it's in. it's the system yeah and when the system is it's fucked unfortunately there isn't much you can like no matter how good or kind or you know how 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 your intention how good your intentions are you're still working in a bad system so you end up being a bad person which is why i left medicine in the first place you can't do the right thing and work in a terrible system but i would love to hear because you obviously worked on these health beliefs and i'd love to hear like briefly like what would you say are the main beliefs or mindsets that you changed in the last year that went from I'm a child in front of a doctor to let's be partners what shifted for you do you know or is that like I think the first thing that shifted is to understand how little weight is impacting my health mm -hmm. opposed to what is said mm -hmm. like facts are not here for that the the actual evidence are not here so it's also understanding that Doctors are talking from their education, their degrees, and also their human mm -hmm. type of bias and stuff. So also to recognize, and I, I was able to do that because my parents are teachers. And I know how people see teachers, like they have some ideas of them. And I'm like, they were my parents, guys. I know who they are. <laughs> and no, they are not kings or queens or whatever. They are crazy people. <laughs> They're my parents. And so, you know, to, to start to say, okay, doctors have what they have, but no, they are not perfect. And when they are coming to giving you information that are not covered by evidence, by facts, by truth, then we need to change something, you know? And I also started to realize, yeah, 
the most yeah the biggest one is really weight is not impacting as much as you think also the the fact that this is a system that is trying over and over to mitigate risk and actually as a human if i want to decide that hey i'm okay to take a risk guys yes it's okay i understand maybe i'm going to have a a stroke in 10 years but if i want to if i want to take that risk because you know when you go to the um, cardiologist and they say so uh, your risk of having a, an issue in the 10 next years is five person and i remember we had this conversation and it's like so it means there is 95 percent chances that nothing happened to me why are we showing it in the other way like there is five percent of chance you you may have an issue no there is 95 percent chances nothing happened so guys it's the great news yes. and i remember the cardiologist was like no no but you're fat you have diabetes <laughs> i'm like no you just told me i have 95 percent of it <laughs> that's so true <laughs> And it was like, no, 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 she's not understanding the big problem. <laughs> and I'm like, no, because it's not one. I, I was thinking, I know my chances were 45, and you tell me it's 95. Yeah. Amazing. But it's it's um, it's difficult because, yeah, I think it's also reassuring to have this idea that doctors know it all and that medicine can cure everything. So it, it's a difficult journey, you know. And also, yeah, I just heard another podcast of you of yours before, and you were saying it's not a question of fixing, it's a question of managing it, which is what I've learned the most in the recent years. It's how do I live with it? How do I make it work for me? The meds, the the issues, the fact that yes, now I know I'm going to have to see doctors very often. So it's not, you know, if you go to a doctor office every two years, you don't have to work on this. It's not a big deal. You are going to have a little bit fat phobia every two years. Okay. But me, I have to go with that like very, very regularly. Yeah. So it really became like you cannot not work on this. You cannot not find solution. You cannot continue to be so scared of every single exam and every single time. So I started to prepare my book, like, you know, for the waiting, for example. Do you want to wait me? Okay, whatever. I don't have, I have a big mouse, but not when it's come to that, it's not there. So I'm like, okay, wait me. Don't tell me the number. I don't want to know. You want to know it? Find out, but don't tell me. And that's my compromise. And it's really good because I'm like, okay, I'm giving you what you want, but don't come around with this with me. And it worked for me. It worked for me for eight years. I didn't wait myself. I mean, I, I didn't know the number me. And my weight was the same. It was the first time in my entire life that I wasn't in a diet. I wasn't looking at how much I was waiting or whatever. And my weight was the same. Yeah. One kilo different, you know? The so, proof yeah. was there. And I'm like, this is fact, Lisa. You cannot continue to believe in stuff yeah. when the facts are here. Yeah. I had a blood pressure check a week ago. My blood pressure was never as good as now. And I just took on weight because I'm on insulin. And one of the side effects of insulin is that you can take on weight. So it's a weight that I know where it's coming from. I was still feeling bad about it, which is weird because you know it's coming. You know it's not your fault. But still, you have the fat phobic stuff coming. And anyway, when I did the blood pressure test, I'm like, oh, what? I'm Taking on weight, my diabetes is not good, but my blood pressure is amazing. I'm like, okay, so there is another way of seeing stuff. And that's part of the thing I want to really transform and think differently. You don't have, the less you focus on your weight, the better you are. That's, I think it's really, really the way I feel. The less I'm talking about the way I, I cannot stand anymore to put everything on the behavior. That's the point. Give me the meds. Give me the meds that work. Stop trying to think it's my behavior that is going to make the difference. It's not about how much sports I'm... I tried that. I, I know myself. That, that's where we are coming back to the partnership. I'm like, I know myself. I know the life I had. I was a smoker. I was drinking an amazing amount of Coke every day. Uh, I wasn't doing any sport anymore or whatever today. 
I'm eating healthy, not healthy like, yeah, I'm a super good fatty, but healthy like a mm -hmm. variety of food, a different That's type a of nutrition, including pizza yes. and burgers and whatever. But it's nutrition. And, yeah, exactly. And I'm doing regular sports. I put myself, I discovered the sitting sport. So I'm doing box, I'm doing heat, I'm doing dance, dancing, chair dancing, etc. I love it. It's amazing. So don't come with behavior. Everything that is about behavior, I know it's better than 10 years ago. So it means you did not, you did not find the meds that I need to manage my health. And there is a French, uh, I don't know if he's a doctor, he's maybe a mental health doctor. And he said something like, when you come to a diabetic uh, doctor, he should treat the diabetic, not the fat person. He's not here to tell you about how to eat. I mean, when I met this crazy lady starting insulin, so insulin, it's very new. It means you have to, um, in, yeah, I'm sorry for people who don't like, I, I was very afraid of that, but you have to put needles in yourself, yourself. Yeah. You have to put needles in yourself. Yeah. It's really traumatizing for me. And instead of talking about that during one hour, she talked about you should eat one fruit per week are you doing sport enough? She should have explained me her expertise on my insulin stuff. And she lost time talking about weight, talking about diet, talking. I don't have time for that, lady. Yeah. And also, you are not an expert. You are. Yeah, an and you know nothing about that. I have an amazing Lebanese nutritionist. She's the queen. Go right. ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Go let the specialist do the specialist stuff. Yeah, and actually, exactly. nutritionists and dietitians are probably without I doubt agree. the most interested in intuitive eating because they have first-hand experience of watching people eat a healthy balanced diet that they prescribe and they know that that's what they're doing and they're still lose, not losing weight so nutritionists and dietitians above everyone else knows the truth so when a diabetes specialist like a or a nurse or a doctor is lecturing you what did you do a degree in nutrition that i'm not aware of yeah. no you didn't because if you did you wouldn't be lecturing me about eating one fruit every week. because that's and also the fact nutrition. that let, let me you if you are a doctor or a nurse or whatever you need to let me at peace with this. I know I'm not losing weight. I know for a fact. If, if my body was ready to lose weight with everything that I changed in my life, it would have happened. So let me be okay with that and be okay with that. Let, let's talk about something else. I swear. About there something. are many other things we can talk about. That that should maybe me be an episode for a podcast as well. Let's talk about something else. I'm done talking about weight. Let's talk about something else. That's maybe a good way to handle it. Anyway, I could talk to you for hours and we will chat. We'll have a chance to talk about it, to talk for hours, but not whilst pressing record. <laughs> you, it has been an absolute pleasure. So, mon gros podcast. Yes. Uh, see, when I wasn't stressing, it was easy. Is, you see? Um, <laughs> available. Okay, it will be linked in the show notes. It's in French. If you happen to speak French, then you need to go to this podcast uh, and uh, I will link it in the show notes. And you have, do you want to link people to your Instagram page as well? Yes, website? of course. It's the same name. Uh, I have the, the podcast and the Instagram page are named the same. I have another account on Instagram that is called About the French Curvy Journey, yeah. which was my first account. And in there, sometimes I'm sharing in English. So <laughs> this is where you can have stuff for yourself. And uh, yes, you can come there with pleasure. And and I hope soon to be on YouTube. And I hope normally there will be subtitles. So even in French, people should have subtitles. Nice. Um, I uh, About a French curvy journey, yeah. um, you have been following me, I think since my first Instagram account. <laughs> I have always known this Instagram handle. And, and even though you and her, I have messaged each other through this particular account, I know. <laughs> as we've talked and I've got to know you and we've worked together, it, it took me until like last week, I was last week years old, when I suddenly realized, oh my gosh. Is this you? Are you? It's me. <laughs> Good Instagram account. I'm going to link them both. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank on you very much. Well. And uh, for those of you who are um, sticking around, I'll be back next week. I will probably not have another guest because look, three is, I feel like I've done you, I've done you proud with three. <laughs> it will be me rambling on again. I might have another, people had some good feedback about um, 
the the made up characters they were enjoying them so I might I might make up some more characters I might even prepare myself a bit better so yeah you have all that to look forward to thanks very much for joining me everyone or joining us I should say and thanks so much Lisa for being here thanks yeah 